All right, so uh, welcome everyone to the colloquium. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Larry Goof uh, from MIT. He got his PhD uh, with Tom Rovka in 2005, uh, was a postdoc at Stanford and Toronto uh, and uh, worked at Courant and then uh, came to MIT. Uh, he has done a lot of great work on uh, Rome of systolic inequality, on Erdos distinct distances. Uh, he worked on Kakea conjectures, uh, uh, Kakea conjecture. Uh, he won a Sloan Fellowship, was a speaker uh, at uh, the ICM in India, and uh, he received a Simons Award, a Clay Award. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, uh, Salem Prize uh, was elected a fellow of the MS and the uh, Buckner Memorial Prize and uh, Mariam Mirzahani Prize in Mathematics. Uh, and uh, so uh, now, uh, so today Larry uh, will speak about uh, local smoothing for the wave equation. Uh, it's all yours. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, you know, in some ways, of course, it's much nicer to really be there. It's a little, a little weird to do this, but I hope we feel that we're connected. And, and I, I must say that I've gotten to go more places and, and talk with more people I'd like to talk to because of doing it on the computer. Um, and it's, it's nice to be here. Um, I'm going to talk today about the local, local smoothing for the wave equation, which is from joint work with Hong Wang and Ray Xiang Zhang. Um, and uh, so first at the beginning, we'll spend some time um, getting intuition about the wave equation and explaining what the questions are. And hopefully it will be understandable for a broad audience. And please um, stop me if you have questions. Okay, so I'm gonna start by introducing the wave equation and, and look at some examples and try to ex uh, explain what the motivate what the question is. So the wave equation, um, it describes sound waves or vibrating membranes, <clears throat> things like that. And so it's, we have a function that depends on x, which is a space variable, and t, which is the time variable. So say air pressure. And this is the equation. Um, this is the equation. Although writing it with partial derivatives like that isn't going to be the most helpful thing for us for building intuition. It makes sense in any number of dimensions, but we're going to focus on dimension two. That's where our theorem is um, and where it's easiest to draw some pictures. Okay. So the first thing that I'd like everybody to know about the wave equation is that it's a physical thing and there's some physical thing called energy, which is conserved. Um, and this is the formula for the energy. So at a given time, you integrate some, some partial derivatives of u squared. And it's conserved, that means that this, this quantity doesn't depend on t. But it's a little bit complicated looking. And it's worth noting that in a lot of situations, this much simpler integral, just the integral of the norm of u squared, is approximately conserved also. As um, related to the conservation of energy, it's gonna be true in all the examples that we look at. Okay, and when people study the wave equation, they mostly talk about the initial value problem, which is if you know the air pressure or whatever at the initial time, figuring out what it's gonna do in the future. So um, to set it up, you need to know the initial value of the air pressure. And you also need to know the initial time derivative of the, of the air pressure. And the reason is that it's a second order differential equation. What the, it, it, the equation says um, del t squared of u equals Laplacian of u. Um, so it tells us the second derivative in time and we need to know the first derivative in time and then we can predict everything else. And a general goal when we, when we study the PDE is to try to understand how the properties of the solution over all time relate to the properties of the initial data. Um, so let's start to look at an example. I think the simplest example is, is um, like this. Suppose you start with like a localized high pressure zone and you let that evolve, what will happen to it? So mathematically, it means the initial data is that u naught of x is a smooth bump function that's supported on a ball of some radius. And I'm gonna say a small radius, one over capital R. And it has an amplitude, we say one for convenience. And let's also suppose that u1, the initial time derivative, is, is zero, just to keep it simple. Then how does it behave? How does it evolve over time? 
Um, okay, so I made a picture to show this, which, which was way too small, but now I'll zoom in on the picture. And this is what happens. Um, so at time zero, the solution is uh, localized on this little ball of radius one over R, it's the blue thing. And then over time, it spreads out. So at time a half, it's localized on this annulus. And then at time one, it's localized on that annulus. And it spreads outward um, over time. So that's qualitatively what happens. So the wave is dispersing at the speed of sound. And as it, as it spreads out, the amplitude decreases. So um, now let's talk about the, the a little more quantitatively. Um, so at time one, say, the solution is concentrated on this pink annulus. And the radius of the annulus is one because the speed of sound is one in our, in our convention. And it's been moving for time one. So, so it's, on, it's localized on this annulus of radius one. And the thickness of the annulus is one over R because that's the thickness of the initial ball. Okay. And then the other thing we have to know to describe the solution is the amplitude. In other words, the absolute value of U of X one. And that, that decays, um, and it, so it's started, the initial amplitude was one, and now it, it decays, it's like big R to the minus a half. So why, why big R to the minus a half? Well, why does it decay? As, it's, as the energy spreads out, the energy density goes down, and so this, this amplitude is going down. And why exactly this? It's because this integral of U squared is basically conserved. Um, so, so using that equation and comparing the area of the pink annulus to the area of the blue disc, um, you work out that this is what it should be. Okay, so that's the most fundamental solution of the wave equation. It's actually closely related to what's called the fundamental solution of the wave equation. Um, but here's a cool thing about the wave equation. The wave equation has time symmetry. So if you've made a video of some waves that were following the wave equation, and you ran that video backwards, they would still appear to be solving to be solving the wave equation. And actually, you couldn't tell whether with that you know which way the video is supposed to go because they're both physically correct. Um, so that means that instead of starting focused on a little ball and spreading out into an annulus, if we reverse time, we could have a solution that starts evenly spread over this pink annulus and it moves inward to the orange annulus, and then at time one it focuses on a small region, this small blue ball. And initially its amplitude is not very large, but all that energy concentrates on this blue ball and makes a very large amplitude. So that's a really important example for the wave equation. It's sort of like a shock wave. It's been challenging to produce this physically, but, but engineers maybe can with care. So you make a, like a shock wave that's traveling inward and the shock wave all arrives at the same time at a point at the origin. And it, it generates a tremendous pressure at that one point or in a tiny neighborhood. So that's what this solution is doing. Okay, so that is called the focusing solution. And we can continue that solution. So it's, it starts off with the shock wave that travels inward and focuses very intensely on this small ball. And then if we keep going in time, actually we have exactly the same initial data. We have the, same, the initial data we started with, this focused uh, high pressure zone. And, and it, it spreads back out. So in the picture, at time, at time zero, the solution is on this pink annulus and it's moving inward. Time a half, it reaches this orange annulus. At time one, it focuses on this little blue ball and then it keeps going. So at time three halves, it spreads, it, it gets back here. So it spreads back out onto the orange annulus and at time two, it spreads back out onto the pink annulus. That's what the focusing solution does. And the notable thing is it only focuses for a moment. And then it spreads out again. Okay, now this focusing thing is an important phenomenon for the wave equation. So in the world of partial differential equations, or say, let's say time evolution equations, two important ones are the heat equation and the wave equation. And solutions of the heat equation, they just always spread out over time. But solutions of the wave equation can focus, and it's an important difference between them. And the local smoothing conjecture is about how strongly can a solution to the wave equation focus. And um, the, there's a vague conjecture that we're gonna make more precise, but the vague conjecture is that this example that we just saw that I called the focusing example, that's the most extreme focusing which is possible. Okay. So 
Um, we're going to spend. Right. And uh, so, a silly question: uh, If you change the geometry, if you do it on a sphere, right, then uh, there is a big focusing of all uh, meridians which start at North North Pole focus at the South Pole. Uh, so uh, geometrically, that's different from flat and negative. Uh, if you uh, uh, does uh, is is the geometry important somehow in in the locals moving conjecture or not? That's a great question. Yeah. So the wave equation and and the and the local smoothing conjecture they all make sense on Ramanian manifolds. Um, and um, let me so take that. Let's all take that question as foreshadowing. And a little later in the talk, we'll come back to it. And it'll be a nice moment. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So so now let's try to make the conjecture precise. So now I have to um, talk about. Yeah. Let's do. Yeah. Can I make a comment? Yeah. I mean, all that you were looking at was distance spheres, and you were looking at, you know, distance spheres collapsing to a point at the center, and that just exists on any Riemannian manifold. The fact that you can get additional types of focusing at other points doesn't seem to. Uh, doesn't seem to be important. It's just trying to figure out if the way that distance spheres collapse at a point, if that's the maximum type of focusing that it can occur. See what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't see that. I don't see that the geometry is actually going to be different on a different Riemannian manifold. It's all just about the focusing of distance spheres. Yeah. yeah okay. So so maybe it's maybe it's a local thing. Yeah. It's just a focusing of a distance sphere of any small radius when you let the radius go to zero. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. So maybe I should answer the question a little bit. So on any Ramanian manifold, you could uh, build this focusing solution and it would behave uh, pretty much the same. Um, and in a little bit, we'll talk about other solutions and worry about what they might do. And then potentially there could be a difference and we'll talk more about that. Okay. Should we be preoccupied with the initial condition, the, the jump between the uh, pressure equal one and the pressure equals zero uh, regions. I mean, there'll, there'll be a sharp discontinuity. Does that play a role? Oh, um, let's see. Um, it, um, uh, we, we, we could ask about that. So there are different, different um, kind of norms that we could talk about, um, but, uh, um, in the in in the local smoothing problem, we won't uh, say? we won't worry that much about the regularity of the of the jump. What do I want to say? I think that leads into into this. So when when we talk about when we try to make it quantitative, um, we have to worry about are we just measuring how big things are, or are we measuring how regular they are? Um, uh, time last question. At uh, time. T equal one, is the is there still a jump, or it has been smoothed? Um, so in this picture. Oh no no no! The, the previous one, one time t equals zero was your initial condition. The the previous slide, I guess. Yeah. Uh, no previous one. <laughs> this one. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So at time equal one, when you're on radius one. Right. So. All of these solutions are C infinity smooth. Um, it's a little bit hard to draw it from this overhead view, but okay. it goes from being one down to being zero rather quickly. It goes okay. down in a distance one over R. Okay. And that's kind of similar here. So if you look at the pink thing, it's zero outside. It goes up smoothly and back down over a length scale one over R. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and that's kind of the um, uh, right. So you know, as as R gets bigger, the thing is focusing into a smaller and smaller ball. So we need to sort of take R into account when we ask, like, how much can it focus? So, like, the bigger R is, the more it's focusing. So we can do that um, by taking talking about frequency support. So we say that the solution U has frequency support in the ball of radius R if the Fourier transforms of the initial data are supported in in the ball of radius R. So our, our, our example, our focusing example is, is, has frequency support in the ball of radius R, and that corresponds to being physically focused in a ball of radius one over R. 
Okay, so here's a vague conjecture too, but a little more precise. So pick any R, and if a solution has frequency support in the ball of radius R, then it shouldn't focus any more than the example we just saw. So and another way of saying that is that the, the jump from one to zero should only take place over the length scale one over R. So we're only looking at competitors that have that, that um, regularity that jump at that speed. Okay. And um, okay, so now we need to quantify. So now we have a list of competitors and, we, and then we'd like to say that the example we looked at focuses the most. So now we need a quantitative way of saying how much did something focus? Okay, so this is a little picture of the solution we talked about before. It starts off spread over the pink annulus and at time one it focuses on the blue ball. And here's a question for your intuition. Which one would be bigger? The integral of u to the fourth dx at time zero, oh, where the pink, or the integral of u to the fourth dx at time one. And remember that the integrals of this of, of norm of u squared is basically constant. Okay, so here's the answer. Um, the answer is it's the integral of the fourth power is bigger um, at time one. And why is that? Well, if you look at the integral of the fourth power, say at time zero, at time zero, the integral is basically all going to come from the pink zone. And on the pink zone, um, the norm of u is like big r to the minus a half. So I can take two powers of u and replace them with two powers of r to the minus a half, and I leave the other two. Okay, now for comparison, let me do the same with the blue. At time one, this integral is coming basically entirely from this little blue ball where u has size one. So I can take two of these powers and replace them with ones. Okay, and now I have to compare these two integrals and it's, it's clear how to do that because the integral of u squared is about the same. And this factor here, it makes this integral, makes the time zero smaller than the time one. Okay, um, so the moral of that is that one way to think about focusing is that the L4 norm goes up. The L4 norm at some later time is way bigger than the L4 norm at the initial time. That's a way of measuring, quantifying that this, that, that this solution has focused. Okay. So here's a theorem that controls focusing. Um, if you have a solution to the wave equation on R2 with frequency support in the ball of radius R, and just for convenience, let's say the, time der the initial time derivative is zero, then the, the integral of the fourth power at time one is at most R times bigger and a constant factor than it was at time zero. But which, and this, this R times bigger is what actually happens in the focusing example. Okay, so remarks. Um, there's a more general theorem if you don't like this artificial condition. Um, this theorem is sharp in the focusing example that we looked at. Um, and it works in any dimension and it works for, it doesn't have to be the exponent four, it works for other exponents too. Okay. Um, and so the this power of the radius is, is the same in all dimensions. Or, uh, no, or the, maybe not. Yeah, no, the power, so the, there'd be a power of the radius uh, and this yeah, okay. depends on the dimension and on the p. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's a messy formula, which I don't remember. But what I do remember is that it's sharp in the focusing example. So to find this power, what I do is I write, I write down the focusing example, I work it out, and that's the power. Okay. Um, so that's a, a nice theorem, and it says in a sense that, that the, the focusing example is the focus is the most. But... There's more to the story. And the, the thing that Sog observed is, uh, like we talked about before, the focusing example only focuses for one moment in time and then it spreads out again. And so, so he suggested that in general, a solution to the wave equation can focus intensely at one moment, but it can't stay focused for a long time. So quantitatively, that means instead of as doing an estimate at, at a particular time, t equals one, which just controls how much it's focused at, at that one moment, time one. We should do an estimate over a range of times, say from one to two. And if we could estimate this integral, that would control how much it focuses, I don't know, on average um, between time one and time two. Okay, so he basically conjectured, he computed what happens for the, for the, um, uh, for the focusing example, and he conjectured that this 
almost holds for all the solutions of the wave equation. And this is still the worst case. So here's the precise form of the conjecture. So um, for any epsilon, there's a constant. So that if you take any solution of the wave equation with frequency support in the ball of radius r, and this is time derivative zero for convenience or something more complicated, then when you look at the integral of the norm of u to the p on a range of times from one to two, it's only a little bit bigger than the integral at the initial time. So, so there might be one time t where, where this integral dx is a lot bigger than the initial time, say by a factor of r. But if you average over all the times from one to two, then the average is, is at most a tiny bit bigger than the initial integral. Okay. Um, and, um, and he made conjectures for other powers of P that where you have to put an exponent on the R and he did it in high, higher dimensions. And the focusing example is the sharp example for his conjecture. Okay, let me pause there and make sure, um, especially for people from other fields that it's kind of clear what this conjecture says. Or yeah, see if people have questions or comments. Well, uh... Is it related to eigenfunction concentration? Uh, because uh, there is also, you know, uh, about like comparing LP to L2 at uh, different energies. And of course you can fully expand the solutions, but, uh, and I know SOG uh, also, you know, thought a lot about that, right? I mean, uh, so, but. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, there, I don't, they have a common flavor, but I don't know that I wouldn't say they're directly related. Like they don't imply things about each other. I mean, you can see from the inequality that for an eigenfunction, it's not even, you can, you know, there's the same on both sides. That's just, you know, e to the i t eigenvalue u and it just cancels out, right? Yes. So no, they're, they're not related. I mean, uh, the eigenfunction concentration problem has completely different types of extremals. For one thing, they're invariant under geodesic flows. So you can't concentrate under more than just one geodesic, right? They, they have a different geometry to them. Yeah, that was well said, that was well said. Okay. Um, okay, so um, the theorem I, I'm gonna present to you is that the local smoothing conjecture is true in two dimensions when D is two. And it's still wide open when D is at least three. All right, could I, could I ask what, what does local refer to? I thought you would have called this the averaged smoothing conjecture or something. What, what's local? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that would have been a, a equally good or better name for it. Um, here was Sog's innovation. People looked before at um, R2 cross a single time. And people looked before at R2 cross R all times. And if you think about either one of those things, you can't quite get at the phenomenon that he gets at here. And his innovation was he took a time interval, one to two. And so it's like a local chunk of all time. That's what local refers to. Okay, thank you. And you kind of think of it as some kind of uncertainty principle, no? Because uh, you were saying that, okay, you know, you can focus a lot, but for a very short time, so that very superficially it reminds you of uncertainty principle, but but it, it's probably uh, maybe a different story. But uh... right, right. No, I yeah, I hear that. Um, so it's hard to know. I mean, the 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 Schrödinger equation is a little is is like exactly connected to quantum mechanics, um, and then there are estimates a little bit in this spirit for the Schrödinger equation that I consider to be cousins of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry. <laughs> okay, so here's the plan for the rest of the talk. So part two, we're gonna look at some more complicated examples. They illustrate like, what do you have to worry about to prove a theorem like this? And along the way, I'll explain why is there this factor r to the epsilon in the statement of the theorem? And why is the problem still really hard when d is bigger than three? And I'll throw in uh, what happens on curved spaces.
And then in part three, we'll talk about um, some an idea from the proof, hopefully, if we have, if we have time. Uh, okay, so um, a, a very important example for solutions to the wave equation is called a wave packet. It's a particular solution of the wave equation that stays localized in space for a while. Um, and they're important in, uh, in the theory because we like to decompose solutions into wave packets um, uh, and use them as building blocks. So here's what one wave packet looks like. Uh, they come in all frequencies. This is a frequency R wave packet. So at time zero in, um, in physical space, if you look over here, it's localized onto a small rectangle, this blue rectangle here at time zero. So that's just where, this is just a picture of its support. What does the function look like? Um, it mostly depends upon x1. So I drew it as a function of x1 um, if you, as you go across at this height here. And what happens is it's, you know, it's zero for a while when you're outside of the support. Then there's a negative bump, then there's a positive bump, and then it goes back to being zero. So that's what it looks like as, as you traverse the rectangle that way. And it basically doesn't depend on x2, except it slowly dies off as you go across the edge of the rectangle. It's not, I mean, it's not literally supported on this rectangle, but it's mostly, it decays rapidly away from there. So that's what it looks, that's what the initial data looks like. And the special thing about this initial data is the way it evolves over time, which is basically that the solution just translates in that direction. So um, here's what it does over time. At time zero, it's on this rectangle. And then at time a half, it gets over here, it moves the distance a half. And then at time one, it gets over there. And they can be oriented in any direction in, in physical space. So it could, it could start here and go that way. It could start here and it goes that way. OK. And we're going to build on this example. All the interesting stuff is going to be like taking a lot of these examples and putting them together. So it's a good place to pause and ask for, see if there are any questions about, about this example. Is the initial speed uh, fixed or at zero? The derivative. Ah, okay, good question. I, uh, it's fixed. Yeah, I didn't draw for you. I should have drawn, logically speaking, del t of w at x1, 0, 0. Um, and it's fixed. It looks kind of similar to this. It's not 0. Um, okay. And it has to be done correctly to, to make it work, to travel that way. Okay. This is the thing that decides if it's moved toward the right or left. That's right, and yeah, that's right. And that in particular decides if it moves right or left. That's right. Yeah, good question. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, so that's one wave packet. And they're important because if you take any solution to the wave equation with frequency around R, then you can decompose it as a sum of a bunch of wave packets. So each WJ looks like the function from the last page. And also a nice feature is that the different WJs in this sum are orthogonal to each other. So that's often a helpful way of understanding a complicated solution. Okay, so to illustrate that, I wanna look at the focusing example again and think about how it's made up out of wave packets. So remember that at time zero, the solution is evenly spread over a thin annulus. And that thin annulus, you can think of as being made up of um, little rectangles. And there is one wave packet for each of these little rectangles. And they're traveling inwards. They travel this way. OK, and the circle has radius 1. So what happens at time 1? This wave packet travels down to here, and it's there. This wave packet travels inward to here, and it's there, and so on. And they all cross each other at the origin. So all these wave packets pile up at the origin, uh, which helps to produce this very high pressure um, uh, isolated spot at the origin. Um, also, when they pile up, actually, you have to pay attention. Remember, each wave packet has um, positive and negative parts. So when, when they're all on top of each other here, you have to think carefully about how they add up. Um, and the, the focusing example is also rigged. So at this red dot, they're all positive. And that also contributes to having a very strong focusing at this little tiny red dot scale. OK, so that just illustrates how you can take any, uh, any solution to the wave equation and think about it by breaking it up into these building blocks, uh, wave packets, and then, and, and then estimate it by, by thinking about how those wave packets are interacting with each other. 
And we want to do that for other solutions. So now I'm going to show you a really tricky solution um, that Tom Wolf came up with um, and that um, uh, gave people the feeling that this is a tricky problem. OK, so his example is built out of tubes. So a tube of wave packets is I just take a bunch of wave packets parallel to each other to make a longer rectangle like this. That's, so this is the initial wave, what it looks like at t equals 0. And over time, the whole thing just shifts this way. So at time 1, it gets here. And between time 1 and time 2, it slides across this purple rectangle. And so its, it's rightmost end finishes over there. OK, so by itself, um, not that strange. Um, and then the next step is he took a lot of these tubes and he combined them in a cool way. So the tubes are arranged according to a wonderful pattern that Besikovich found around 1920 in his work on the Kakea problem. So the initial blue tubes are disjoint from each other. But after you slide them all over to become the purple tubes, the purple tubes overlap quite a bit. And quantitatively, the purple area is about 1 over log r times the blue area. Um, the, R, the, the R in the picture, you might, you might not remember that the thickness of this rectangle is 1 over R to the half. Um, so this, is, this R is basically measuring the eccentricity of these rectangles in this picture. Okay, now why is that um, interesting for the wave equation? Well, initially, all of the energy is kind of spread among these blue rectangles. And then later, all of the energy is in these purple rectangles. And since the purple area is smaller than the blue area, the energy has more concentrated. So those LP norms are going to go up. Now, it's only a little bit more concentrated. It's only by a factor of log r, right? whereas the focusing example is concentrated by a factor of r or something like that, so much more dramatic focusing. This is only a little focusing. But the thing that's better about it is that that focusing persists all the way from time 1 to time 2, because all the way from time 1 to time 2, uh, you know, remember that time one, uh, at time one, this blue wave packet has moved there. And then at time two, it's moved there. So the energy stays in this purple region for the whole time interval from one to two. And so there's a little bit of focusing that persists uh, for that whole time. Okay, so quantitatively, in terms of these integrals of u to the fourth, it, the, this integral is like log r times bigger than the initial integral for every t from 1 to 2, and so also when we take the average. OK, so that explains why we need a uh, log r or an r to the epsilon or something like that in, um, in Sog's conjecture. Um, and it also ex related to why it's an open problem in higher dimensions. So suppose, so in general, in any dimension, you could try to make an example like this. You could, you could make these tubes, and you could have this effect. And the quantitative bounds would depend on the ratio of the blue volume to the purple volume. If you can make the purple volume way, way smaller than the blue volume, you get very strong focusing and a strong example for the local smoothing problem. So we care about that ratio. Um, and we don't understand that ratio very well. Uh, we, actually, we do understand it well in two dimensions. And the soup is the logarithm of the eccentricity. This, this thing here is the eccentricity of the rectangles. So essentially, Besikovich's original construction or small modification um, is the worst case, and it produces a logarithmic um, compression, a logarithmic ratio between the, the blue volume and the purple volume. But in higher dimensions, we really don't know how this thing behaves. We don't know whether it should be still logarithmic or whether it should be a polynomial of delta. And it's a pro this problem is closely related to the Kakea conjecture. Um, so that's a, uh, I don't know, a well-known open problem in my field that people consider to be very hard. And, um, and we, we, the, the um, local smoothing problem in higher dimensions conjecture, uh, if, if it's true, it would imply the Kakea conjecture. Um, and so that's a huge roadblock. OK, before I go on to part three, I think it's a good moment now to talk about um, curved geometry. So curved geometry. Um, so I guess I'd like to think about this uh, sort of a table. So there's on one axis, we'll put the dimension. And there's two dimensions versus higher dimensions. And on this axis, there are two cases. There's 
uh, flat Euclidean, and then there's curved. Okay, so uh, local smoothing conjecture here, the LC conjecture here is true. And actually in the curved case, it is also true. Uh, oh yeah, I think it's more dramatic to say this in the other order. Forget I said that for a second. Here, um, the local smoothing conjecture is wide open in higher dimensions. That was what we just said. Okay, now chronologically here, the local smoothing conjecture, if you go in higher dimensions and you curve the geometry, it is false. And that is, was done by um, Minakazi and Sock. Minakazi and Sock. Um, and th their construction is based on Wolf's construction. So the Kakea conjecture is wide open in, um, in Euclidean space, but in a curved three-dimensional space, they were able to bank an analog of this picture where the purple set is basically two-dimensional, but the blue set is basically three-dimensional. And so the purple set is much, much smaller than the blue set. And, that, and then that example shows the local smoothing conjecture is wrong. Okay, however, um, in the curved two-dimensional two, two case, the local smoothing conjecture is still true. So I think that's, I think that's quite an interesting thing. So the curvature matters a lot, but the two-dimensional result is really robust. Um, and that was proven recently by she at all. Cool. Uh, so that was a great question and I wanted to wait till then to answer it. Um, okay, so Got that's it. the end of part two. Yep. That's the end of part two of the talk, which is about the kind of examples we might be worried about. And this, uh, Minikotsi saw this higher dimensional uh, Kakea construction. It happens in, in positive curvature and negative curvature or uh, only in? Right, it happens in mixed curvature. So, I, I mean, a, a, a very complicated Ramanian metric certainly could have some positive curvature somewhere and some negative curvature somewhere else. Um, and that's what they need. And that means it's, it's an open problem whether it still might be true if you if you said positive curvature, uh, or if you said negative curvature, those are both. Uh, okay, okay. So, so they they need some they they have some special example where they produce. Yeah. Okay. But but yeah. if, yeah, if you have you know any odd Riemannian metric, then it's still not clear if they can do this construction. Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. You know, this curved case, it's not really natural to think of it as one conjecture. It's really natural to think of it as many conjectures, one for every Riemannian manifold. Mm -hmm. And they have this specially crafted example of a manifold where it's false, but that leaves a huge number of manifolds where it is open. Okay. 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 And, and what, what year is that? It's the, it's the 90s. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So let's start to talk about the proof. So what have we learned so far? Uh, we learned that we can organize our um, solution into wave packets. And one of the things that we have to worry about <clears throat> is how the wave packets overlap over time. In particular, if the wave packets are disjoint at time zero, we, they don't have to be, but that's an interesting special case. If they're disjoint at time zero, then um, they at most of the times between a half and one, they can't overlap too much. So this shows just a bunch of wave packets. This one goes from here to here to here. This one goes from here to here to there. And you know, can you rig these things so that they start off disjoint, but at most of the times between one and two, they overlap a lot. That's, the ki that's one kind of thing we have to estimate to do local smoothing. Okay. So uh, I wanna say a little bit about Tom Wolf's work on local smoothing. Around the year 2000, he proved some deep estimates about the local smoothing problem. And he used ideas coming from another field, from combinatorial geometry. Um, so wave packets travel in straight lines. And so he realized that estimating how much wave packets overlap, estimating like the intersection patterns of wave packets, is kind of related to just estimating the intersection patterns of lines. And there's an interesting literature about that. So, okay, what well, might be asked? So suppose we have a set of lines in the plane, finite set of lines. Um, and our rich point is just a point that lies in at least our lines. So 
these two orange points, they lie in three lines, so they're three rich. And it's at, at least R, so they, they're also two rich. Okay, and the combinatorial question was, how many R rich points can you make with L lines? If you try to arrange them to make as many as possible, how many can you make? That question was raised by Paul Erdős in the 60s probably. Um, and, uh, and it was answered by Samaretti and Trotter in the early 1980s. So they, they said that this expression, that's the most R rich points you can make with L lines. And uh, it's a really cool theorem. And one thing is it's very sharp. So it's sharp up to a constant factor for every value of L and every value of R. And it has nowadays, I don't know, a handful of proofs. But an interesting thing about all of the proofs is that they all use topology in some way, uh, which I think is kind of cool because the statement of the problem is not so clear if it should, I mean, so, so one of them uses, for example, the Euler formula, uh, phases minus edges plus vertices equals Euler characteristic. Okay. So um, Tom Wolfe learned the, the proof of this and he adapted it to estimate how wave packets overlap each other. And he used that to prove new estimates about the wave equation. And in particular, he proved SOG's local smoothing uh, conjecture when for really big exponents. Um, and a paper that's been like really influential in, in harmonic analysis. Um, and one of, the, one of the many ways it's been influential is it brought these two communities together. There was a community of people in combinatorics who thought about problems of this spirit and there's a community of people in harmonic analysis. They weren't connected before, but now they're very much connected. Um, um, and uh, anyway, so that's been really interesting. It influenced my work a lot and many other people. Okay, what's, the, what's new in our proof? So our proof uses a different method to estimate how the wave packets overlap. And it builds on a method that Van used to estimate um, the intersection patterns of lines in finite fields. So, okay. So the, this problem about intersecting lines, it makes perfect sense in finite fields. Let's just phrase it. So say FQ is the finite field with Q elements. And I suppose I have a set of lines in the plane FQ squared. And by, by the way, what is a line? A line is an affine, one-dimensional affine subspace. Okay. And an R-rich point is just a point that lies in at least R lines. And we can ask the same question. How many R-rich points can you make with L lines in FQ squared? So it depends on R and L and Q. And we ideally would like to understand this question for, you know, for all the R's and L's and Q's. And that looks very difficult. It's still open. Um, the first non-trivial estimates were proven by Bergen and Katz and Tao. And in 2011, Van introduced an elegant method which um, gives sharp results for some interesting values of R and L and Q. Uh, and it's also very simple. It's also very um, concise. So I can I basically, I can show it to you. So here's how it works. So L is my set of lines. Let's call them L1, L2, and so on. And actually, let's say that L1 is the characteristic function of the first line of L. Um, so if I add up, L sub i of x, if I add up L sub i of x, that just tells me how many lines x is in. So a point is r rich if this sum is bigger than r. So basically we want to understand this function, sum of L i of x. Okay. So here was um, Van's idea for understanding this function. He took each L sub i and he broke it up into two pieces. He wrote it as one over q, which is its average value, plus the rest of it, L sub i minus one over q, which has mean zero because we subtracted off the average value. And another way to think about this is decomposition as a Fourier analyst, that the one over Q is the zero frequency part of L sub I and the rest is the non-zero frequencies. And here was his key observation. The, these functions here, the non-zero frequencies are orthogonal to each other. So L, L1 not equal to zero and L2 not equal to zero, those, those are orthogonal. And you can check it by direct computation. It's not, it's not difficult. Um, okay, so what does that mean? So now let's try to add them up. So I wanna add up all the L sub i. I can add up all of the um, constant parts and I can add up all of the high frequency parts. Right? So L sub i has a constant part and, and this high frequency part that's with I. Okay, adding up all the constant parts is easy. It's each of one is one over Q. So I get the number of lines over Q. And by the way, that's the average value of this sum. 
So this just gives me the average value. And then this is some oscillation around the average value. How can we bound that? Well, these functions are orthogonal. So we can use orthogonality to bound the L2 norm of their sum. And this, the L2 norm in finite fields means this. Okay, so our, so our function that we want to study here, it has a constant part and then some oscillation with a controlled L2 norm. And that's how, how Van bounded this function. So visually, if, we, if, if, we, if I, I want to make a portrait of the sum of the L sub i's, um, so imagine this grid is fq squared, say q is five, and the red dots are places where the constant part dominates the sum, and the blue dots are places where the um, oscillate, the variation, the perturbation dominates the sum. Okay. Um, and we can estimate how many blue dots there are because we know the L2 norm of this thing. Um, and um, in interesting cases, there actually are very few blue dots at almost all of the points that this thing is close to its average. Um, and so, so we can use that to prove interesting estimates for the sum of Li or for the number of R-rich points. So that was Van's method. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Um, should, should we, should we, we could stop there or we could do five minutes and talk about how, how we tried to adapt that to, um, to waves. Of course, five minutes. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. So we were studying uh, wave packets. So remember, we have a solution to the wave equation called U, which is some sum of wave packets. And um, the, the actual WJs have positive and negative parts. But if you want to think about how those rectangles are overlapping with each other, it makes sense to look at norm of WJ squared which is just a positive thing on, on those little rectangles. So, and the, if we study the sum on J of the norm of WJ squared, that's kind of telling us how the wave packets geometrically are overlapping. And it's also kind of analogous to Van's sum, sum on I of LI. Okay, so we wanna bound, we wanna understand this thing and prove bounds about it. Okay, so we're gonna follow his same idea. We're gonna break it into a low frequency part and a high frequency part for, so for each one. And just like in Van's argument, the high frequency parts are roughly orthogonal. So we can use that to help us in the same way. Okay. But what's more complicated is that the low frequency part is not just constant, because it's not, it's not the like incredibly low frequency part, it's just relatively low. So the low frequency part is smeared over a neighborhood of the original wave packet. So that suppose the original wj squared at t equals zero is on that rectangle and then it's moving this way and at t equals one, it gets to this rectangle. What would the low frequency part look like? Uh, at time zero, it would be smeared out over this fatter rectangle and then the fatter rectangle would move. It still just moves by translation and at time one, it gets there. And so we call this red region a wave envelope. It's like fatter thing that contains the original wave packet. That's what the low frequency part looks like. Okay, now there's a difference between finite fields and the real numbers. In finite fields, um, it makes sense to split something as a zero frequency and versus all of the non-zero frequencies. All of the non-zero frequencies are kind of on a similar footing. There's no notion in finite fields that some numbers are bigger than others. They're just zero or they're not. But over R, it's more natural to break things into many different frequency scales. So there's not really just high frequency and low frequency. There are like a lot of different scales. So this is the highest frequency and this is like a medium frequency and that's a low frequency. And there are many say log R different frequencies in, in between. Okay. Um, so we wanted to use that to understand where this sum of WJ squared is large. And um, because WJ itself, we're looking at it at different frequencies at different scales, that produces, um, well, okay. So, so we, we organize the set where this is large into different kinds of geometric pieces that come from the wave envelopes at different scales. So one thing that might happen is we might have like isolated little balls where this sum is large, like what happens for the focusing example. Um, so there's some number of those. 
And those are associated to the highest frequency part of WJ. So these are related to um, the sum of WJ squared, the high frequency part. And remember that these guys are orthogonal and that gives us a bound. So just this orthogonality gives us a good estimate on how big this set of blue points is. Okay, but then there might be stuff associated to the envelopes at a different scale. So like this orange ball here, it might lie in a bunch of different wave envelopes at that scale. And inside of those wave envelopes, there are like a lot of different wave packets. And all of those things contribute to make this sum big on that orange ball. And using related things, but thinking about the frequency scale, we get some estimate for how, how, on the, how many of the orange balls there are and, 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 and how, how big they are. Well, maybe I should say, what does this orange ball look like? It looks like, if you look at the, if you like think of the graph of this function, imagine you're looking down on it, there's like a plateau. It's pretty flat. It's tall, but pretty flat over this orange ball. And then it, it, it gets smaller as you go off the orange ball. So that's, that's, what, that's what this would look like on this orange ball. And we could estimate how many of those there are and how big they are. And that estimate would have to do with um, how many different wave packets there are in these orange envelopes. So it's a little more complicated estimate to write down, but it's an estimate that kind of naturally happens when you uh, adapt Van's proof to Euclidean space and you have all of these different scales instead of just zero and not zero. And putting together all that information, that's the geometric information that we need about how wave packets overlap each other um, to, to, that, help, that helps us to, to get this new estimate about the local smoothing problem. Okay, um, thanks very much for having me. Uh, I'll stop there. Well, uh, let's thank Larry for a great talk. Are there any questions? Um, yeah, I have a I have a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Um, it's about the reference to the Sog and Minikotsi paper. Yeah. So in that paper, they were studying this thing called the Nikita maximal function, and they they found a counterexample to a certain LP estimate on the Nikita maximal function. But uh, they didn't say in that paper there's any relation to local smoothing conjecture. I wasn't quite sure what you were quoting it as a counterexample to. Oh, okay. I should read it. Uh, um, I think once you have the counterexample to the Nikita maximal function, then you like input Wolf's construction with tubes of waves into it, and you would get a counterexample to local smoothing. I don't know. I mean, because uh, that paper was published like, what is it now, 15, 20 years ago. I was, to be honest, as soon as you said it, I started looking it up on that site net and I saw all the papers which have cited it, one of yours included, but I didn't see anybody who cited it for that purpose. In fact, Sog himself wrote some follow-up papers and he doesn't even mention local smoothing or cite any papers on them. So I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Okay, that's a, I admit, I, that sounds a little suspicious. Um, I should look into it. Yeah, I think it's open in higher dimensions. I don't think there's a counterexample. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Uh, Larry, yeah. Suppose we do it on a two torus, which is, I don't know, square torus or something, and we arrange the wave packets to be sort of in, uh, to move in rational directions so that they uh, at some point come back. So can we make it overlap uh, not just, you know, from one to two, but from three to four and whatever. So uh, uh, for a low, for, a, for, in, for several intervals of times, you know, uh, lying in some arithmetic progression or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so once, once we introduce thinking about it on a curved space, um, then we could look at time from one to two, or we could look at some other time interval. Maybe I'll call it um, capital T to two capital T. 
On Euclidean space, it doesn't really matter because by rescaling anything, everything, you can get from a result about this to a result about that. So this was mm. sort of different. But on this manifold, it, it has scales built in. So this would be a whole different problem. Um, so if you take like a unit square torus and you look at this time interval, the waves don't really have time to go around. Maybe they can go around once, but it doesn't matter very much. Uh, but if you look at a long time interval, they can go around many times and then they can keep interacting with each other and it's scary. Um, and, um, uh, and I don't know what would happen, but maybe it's a good moment to mention that there's, uh, it reminds me a little bit of, of the uh, Strickard's estimate for the Schrodinger equation on a torus, um, which, which was one of the big successes of decoupling theory, which is in the background of this talk, this uh, uh, exciting results by Brugan and Demeter building on Wolf's paper that we talked about. Um, one of the things they did is they, they could prove sharp Strickard's estimates on tori that take into account, well, that, 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 that give a sharp estimate for the scary effect that you're talking about, that you have waves going around the torus this way and waves going around the torus that way, and they have many opportunities to pass each other and interact, and how could we possibly control that? And there were a couple of questions from the chat. So uh, one question is uh, why induction on scales and incidence? Um, right. So incidence is another word that means how much things overlap. Um, and induction on scales, I didn't talk about, but it's actually an extremely important uh, part of all of the arguments in this field. Going, going back to, to Wolf's argument. Um, and it comes in because of the following issue. Suppose you have the best estimate you could imagine about how these little rectangles overlap yeah. each other. It's not clear that you've proved local smoothing. Um, why? Well, let's go back and look at the focusing example in wave packets. Um, remember that when we remember that each wave packet has positive and negative parts. And so when we add up the wave packets, we have to think not just about how the rectangles overlap, but how, how the positive and negative parts add up. In fact, that's, I mean, that's, that's the main part of the problem. So for the, in the focusing example, all the positive parts managed to, to line up at this red dot. And that was very important. Um, so, so we have to estimate that too, to under, to, to get estimates for local smoothing. And I only talked so far about the geometry of the rectangles overlapping. Um, and people in the field realized, um, many people, but this was a, a big part of Tom Wolfe's paper, that you can get estimates on that seemingly unrelated problem, of how the positive and negative parts overlap, by using this kind of overlap estimate, but at different scales. Um, and can I say scales of what? Um, but, but, Um, okay, yeah, so, um, here, okay, so here's um, our space time, and we have a time scale of about one. And on that time scale, we have these wave packets. And by the way, they only kind of stay coherent for time one. If you keep going, these will decohere and, and spread out and you'll see a diffusion effect, one of the fundamental things that waves do. So their, their geometry was sort of organized so that um, they would survive for time one. And they're kind of big, they're kind of clunky compared to the whole solution. And you know we, we are interested in structures at a finer scale like that. But if you look at an object at a finer scale, it can't stay coherent for that long, it would, it would spread out. But if you look at a smaller ball in space time, and inside of that smaller ball, you can make finer wave packets that are closer to the final solution. So, uh, so Wolf uses wave packets at all the scales. Um, and, um, and by doing that, and then he can use the overlap estimate, not just for the original wave packet, not just for the original wave packets, but also for all of the new wave packets at the smaller scales. Um, 
Um, and that was, it's hard to find time in a 50 minute talk to say all of the uh, important, but th so this is the other important thing that he introduced, that you can use this, this geometric estimate, not just at this scale, but at all those scales. And then it, it becomes much stronger. And uh, so I think uh, poor Jacques Rivis raised his hand a long time ago. Jacques, could you unmute yourself and? <clears throat> Jacques? Uh, Jacques, we don't hear you. Well, maybe, I don't know. Uh. There's another question in the chat, Dima. Uh, ah, yeah. So why did you propose a decoupling problem in small caps? And what motivated you to suggest improving the decoupling when each f of theta is concentrated in a sparse region? Um, From uh, Tiffany Mangara. Right. Um, so, so de decoupling is a problem that Wolf proposed. It was his way of framing his proof of the local smoothing problem. Um, and um, it was designed to frame it so that you could bring all the scales into play. Uh, and basically what it says is you, you organize all of the, the solution into um, so this theta represents a direction and u theta is all the wave packets going in that direction. So if you just have wave packets moving in one direction, they don't, they just all move in parallel. Nothing scary happens over time. So one of these things by itself is not hard to understand. And the, all the action is in how they interact. And um, decoupling is an estimate like LP norm of u in space and time versus um, the LP norms of each of the U thetas. The decoupling is an estimate that relates those things and it implies local smoothing for some of the P's. Um, so that's what decoupling is and uh, a little bit about why Wolf proposed it. Um, and um, and the, sh the sharp decoupling for, the, for this problem was proven by Brugan and Demeter, but it turns out it doesn't give the sharp local smoothing. Um, and so we looked at the cases that it doesn't cover and the cases that it doesn't cover are sparse, meaning that each U theta, uh, oops, each U theta is on a rather sparse set of, of wave packets as opposed to each U theta kind of evenly filling the whole, the whole space time. Okay, uh, well, if there are no further questions, let's uh, thank Larry once again for a, for a great talk.